Brenton, <clears throat> for joining us here at the Dwelling Show. I really, really appreciate your time. I know you're super, super busy. So just thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I'm just going to um, go through Brenton's bio. So Brenton became a licensed real estate professional for Keller Williams flagship of Maryland in February 2013. So not long ago, um, Brenton's why is making a generation impact is how is real estate investing and is what is serving as the managing member of the real estate investment firm, Credible Home Buyers and the real estate portfolio holding company, Earth Odin. Brenton also founded Rec, which is a Facebook group devoted to showcasing entrepreneurs' lives, behind the scenes. Brenton is also a Keller Williams certified instructor. I love that. I have to, I have to keep going. While serving as an accountant and finance analyst for the Department of Defense for five years, Brenton also got his bachelor's degree in accounting from Towson University. Go Towson. Uh, <laughs> and is now finishing his MBA program. So, Brenton, I think you can do a way better job um, and telling us a little bit more about yourself and kind of what you've been up to lately. Sure. Yeah. Again, thanks for having me. And like you, uh, now live pretty close to Baltimore, Maryland, and I born and raised here in Maryland. In fact, when I was 12 years old, my parents opened up a real estate brokerage and I ran around those hallways. And since, since then, they've done well, though, as you know, like any business, they have their ups and downs. And because of that, they were like, stay out of this real estate world. Don't come in it. Like we're so highly leveraged in it. And they were pretty much like, okay, well do your thing. So I was, I went to Towson university, got my degree in accounting. I grabbed a job with department of defense. And while there, I still had this knack at 19 years old to like, all right, I still want to get in real estate somehow, some way. So I got my real estate license. And the one thing I wasn't so passionate about was sales. Uh, I really wanted to learn the investing game. So I met a mentor in my real estate brokerage who had a lot of money and, and not a lot of time. And I had a ton of time being in college and I had college debt. So I had negative dollars. So I had no money. And we made for a good match because it was like, okay, he had a lot of money, not a lot of time. I have a lot of time, not a lot of money. So um, that's where it all kind of began with real estate investing. At 19, we met. I had one more partner, the three of us, myself, a guy named Josh, a guy named Stu. And the three of us started flipping when I was 20, 21. And then since then, um, I've been through that partnership on my own now. Now I've gotten into rentals. I have the flips going on and I still do some sales on the side. So um, I'm just like trying to take notes. So there's a bunch of stuff in there. So, you know, your parents were basically agents, right? They had their own brokerage and they were kind of saying to you, hey, Brenton, you know, this is, this is all well and good, but we're so leveraged. Um, we're not sure if we want you to go down this path. So having that historical, I guess, um, perception of real estate, why do it, right? Why did you, why did you keep going even though your parents said, because usually when our parents tell us, hey, don't do this, we try to usually do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what was that real rationale for you to keep, you know, plugging ahead? Yeah, great question. I followed their advice as long as I could to stay away, and that lasted like all of one year. I had so many relationships and resources in the industry that <clears throat> there, there was a part of me that's like, all right, at least part-time, I'll make some side money doing this thing because I have, I have the mentors in the game. And this was a lot on the sales side. My parents, outside of owning this brokerage, um, they have never invested in real estate. So the investment side of, of real estate was brand new to me. And in fact, they, since they were building a brokerage, they had majority of their relationships inside of the brokerage world. And as you know, as well as anybody is, there are many agents out there who just don't invest themselves. And that's totally cool. The thing is, um, I actually found it super fascinating to create this own path of, like my parents were like, all right, I asked them, I said, what's the one thing that you would have done knowing what you know now if you went back in time? And they said, I would have invested in real estate in addition to the brokerage look at the property values, look at them. I mean, they're still working every day. Had they just started investing 12 years ago, they would probably be retired now, somewhere very, very warm instead of this cold Baltimore weather. So I look at their advice and, um, and it was excited to create a little new path for uh, our family tree and see what I can do. Uh, I really did want to create it alone. So I 
uh, I did use whatever relationships were available. At the same time, it was creating a whole new um, skill set, building a whole new muscle, never got money from them and uh, just built, still building, but building it since 19 years old and now 24, heading into 25, it's starting to open my eyes a little bit of uh, what they meant by if they wish they would have had invested earlier on. So you definitely, definitely have, I think it's fair to say you have a head start, right? So you started at 19, you started flipping 21, 20, and now you're kind of investing in your 24. So you, we could say you have a good head start. So before we kind of go into the future, I just wanted to go back to something that you said. So now you have, you've de- you're developing this new muscle and you have this hybrid strategy of investing and sales, kind of sales brokerage, right? Mm-hmm. So would you say that for somebody who is, um, I guess maybe they don't have enough money. Do you think that getting the, the license first, right? To kind of get their feet in the door with sales, but then kind of switching or maybe even just having that hybrid strategy is a good way to go. It's a great question. It's one that I get asked often. And I know right now that I have helped over 40 people get their real estate license in the last four years. And I'm a big proponent of getting your license simply because you can develop that skill set and you can get that, those tools such as access to the multiple listing service and being able to get in houses, get access to the industry of other realtors who can send you deals and the brokerage training and understanding how to write those offers and not have to rely on somebody else who might be on vacation when that perfect deal comes around and you can't fend for yourself. So I'm a big fan of getting your tool bag. And even if like, for example, for myself, I am 90% of my focus is investing. 90% of my time will reflect investing. And it's just a little bit on the sales side. And I recommend anybody, like whether you want to do 90% sales and 10% investing or 90% investing and 10% sales, either way, get your real estate license as quick as possible. It's not too hard. It's quick. It's easy. And it's a, this world's one of the largest industries of entrepreneurs. At the very least, you'll get access to some of the most incredible people. Wow. Awesome. So you started flipping, right? You were 20 and you said you had um, a buddy of yours, a partner. How did that first flip go? And would you say having a partner is a good idea or not? Just in general, it's kind of a really tough question, but just in general. Yeah. All right. So that first flip, uh, in hindsight, it would have made like twice, three times as much money or more money than we did. And that's what's funny is like when anybody asks about, oh, tell me about your first flip. I immediately have this like gut wrenching feeling because it's like taking you back to the times where you just struggle. And in that first flip, we got it from another agent in our office. Again, the power of getting your real estate license and networking. And uh, the bank was going to take the keys in three weeks. We swooped in, cash offer, grabbed it. We didn't know what we were really doing. In fact, if I look at those numbers now, I'd probably pass on that deal. So that just goes to show that we got in without knowing. And we owned it. And a week went by and nothing happened. And we're kind of like, all right, this can't be right. So we showed up there, we met in the living room and we started painting the house ourselves. Like legitimately before we did anything else, like we didn't point up, we didn't patch, we literally just started painting. And we're like, all right, this can't be right either. And we had, we didn't have a single uh, contractor lined up, nothing. And pretty much like starting from ground zero, maybe negative. And that's where I realized like, okay, there's something more to this and somebody out there has done it more successfully. And that's when we just started reaching out to other investors, getting more involved in the investment community and piecing together contractors. But I mean, that first clip had everything from not starting on time, not having contractors, doing work myself, uh, making hauling Home Depot and Lowe's trips back and forth, uh, getting these material lists from the contractors and not knowing what anything was because I hadn't even swung a hammer before. So uh, all in all, we did, we, uh, we made like 21,000, split it three ways and went on to our next deal. But um, we, we only made 21,000 because we did a lot of the work ourselves and we used all subcontractors. So I know, not, I, not very I, scalable. So what was like the time frame for that? That was actually a, a pretty quick flip. Uh, it wasn't that big of a project. And um, it was, I think from start to finish, like four and a half months. And we lost like the first two and a half weeks, like, like that. So it just, 
again, I think it's a good timing of the market. Uh, it sold quick. We soon we got listed. Uh, things went well, and had things gone worse, we could have lost money easily. So I really like what you said about you know you guys bought this house and you're like oh we 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 have a we have a we have a house we have an asset and you guys were oh okay so it was kind of like reactionary right it was kind of like after the fact and you also mentioned something in the beginning about mentors so do you think if you and you also said you were reaching out to a bunch of folks like when you got the house like other investors yeah. in, in the area do you think if you had a mentor would that have helped you guys a ton? Oh yeah, um, absolutely. And now with bigger pockets, like heck, if I even knew what bigger pockets was back then, I'd be, I would have been way better off than I was. And additionally, all the local RIAs and other um, resources, even Facebook now and the Facebook groups. So everyone starting now, I mean, if you're listening to this, then you already have a head start, and you won't make the same mistake because I promise you, you won't want to make that mistake. And going to your question about the partners. I found it very um, comfortable to start with partners, people to bounce ideas off of, grow with, hold each other accountable. And without a clear direction of where I wanted to go, it seemed to be the best way is like, all right, a shared direction. And then now, just to give you an idea though, now I am solo and not exclusive with any of my rentals or flips, even though I have partnered on each. And I do like that because I'm just a little bit more clear about where I want to go and I'd rather lead the ship than to be on a ship headed in a different direction. Hmm, interesting. So I'm trying to like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to go two ways now. So on the mentor um, path, would you still say um, a, a good way to look for mentors is for, to look for somebody local or just kind of like somebody somewhere that you can just call and, you know, how do you select a good yeah. mentor? I, another great question. Uh, I think there are two, knowing what I know now, there are two different um, advantages or there's an advantage to each option. So number one, the advantage to finding somebody local is they could physically meet you at the property, walk through it, maybe share some contractors and tons of advantage there, right? And you can also feel like this, you have a closer bond because a lot of face to face, maybe take them out to lunch, send them a gift, whatever. Additionally, what I found, and this is just here later on, is that mentorship outside of your geographical area is, advantageous because they don't see you as a direct threat and when they don't see you as a direct threat they're more willing to share some of their secrets their marketing secrets maybe their scripts formulas spreadsheets whatever it is so i actually uh i found that a healthy balance of both can be the perfect mix hmm. so going back to the the partnerships right you said now you're solo right and you kind of want to be the head of ship and you want to kind of navigate towards your goals what you believe in and your strategies and mm -hmm. partnerships can become you know a little bit tightening because then you have to there's that one person or the other person or the other two people you have to bounce ideas off yeah. um, i mean i'm in a partnership right now uh, he's a great guy um he's awesome actually but i understand maybe kind of what you're saying so in retrospect would you say that now that you're solo are you better off so I, I would argue that yes and no, like, <clears throat> yes, I'm better off following my direction. If that's, if I'm clear about that and I know where I want to go, I understand my values, vision, and my mission. If I wasn't as clear, I would be better off catching somebody else's rocket ship. And they're super clear about where they're headed. They had the system, the infrastructure, the experience. I, in the beginning, would have been better off latching on to somebody who was proven somebody who was killing it and maybe made less money, dedicated more time rather than a partnership of like the three blind mice. And right now I can say like, I'm serving as a vehicle for, I have two part-time employees and they're physically here in Maryland and I am serving as a vehicle for them. And there's an expectation like one day they might have a different vision for their future and that's totally cool. Or they might continue to follow the vision of our company. And I think it's just a matter of matching your vision and values. So two employees, that's, that's fantastic. And is that within your own brokerage? Thanks. That is, uh, yes, yeah, so that's my investment company has, is hiring those two individuals part-time, uh, 20 hours a week. And one's an assistant and the other one's an acquisition specialist. So somebody who's out in the field. And he's 
doing everything from driving for dollars, property renovation estimates, checking on my current renovations and um, doing that part. And then my assistant is serving that assistant admin role with a lot of when it comes to the marketing, database management, CRM and that good stuff. Awesome. So definitely we have to touch on the MBA, right? So you have your, your license, <laughs> yeah. you know, you've got two employees working, you've got projects rolling, you've got this machine just chugging in the right direction, right? With the right values. Why go back to a classroom? Yeah, I, the, the honest truth is this. I was working for the Department of Defense when I started my master's program and I get an automatic promotion with them as soon as I get that degree and they're helping pay for it. So I have since left the DOD two years ago till this December will be two years. And I was already one year into my program. So I was halfway done. They had paid for the half and I was like, all right, at this point, I'll just slowly finish it. So that's me right now. I'm slowly <laughs> finishing simply only because that I started had knowing what I know now I wouldn't have because like, I can just tell you right now, uh, I'm dedicating 10 to 15 hours a week on these papers and these assignments. And uh, I wouldn't say that's the highest dollar per hour activity right now. <laughs> I like that. I like, I like the honest question. So that <laughs> I'm not, I was going to ask a follow-up question, but I think I got my answer <laughs> to, to, to that. Yeah. So, I don't know if I would do it knowing what I know now, but that's all part of the journey, I suppose. Yeah. You don't know I what's mean, ahead. You can connect the dots looking backwards, but not so much looking forward. Right. You know, um, retrospect, you know, vision 2020, when you look back, right. No. So now you're in this very, very good spot, right? You're in this very, very good spot in your life. And you've got projects running, um, you've got the flips. What would you say um, that you know now that you could have really, really done in the very, very beginning? So there's some, you know, you've got a dwell listener out there thinking, well, I'm, yeah. I'm 19, I'm 20. You know, this was Brenton five years ago. What would you do differently from what you know today? Yeah, I would have definitely, uh, to reiterate, I would have definitely hopped on somebody else's rocket ship who was killing it understood their infrastructure and how to service deals at a high level. Like I didn't understand leveraging capital. So we were buying one and we would sell that. We'd buy it, fix it, flip it, sell it, and then take that capital and buy another. And that was all cash rather than leveraging it with hard money, private money or institutional financing. I also would have gotten into rentals earlier. I had this limiting belief that like you have to have money to get rentals. rentals. And now right now I have 15 units and uh, a four more coming and th those are with a partner, a 50, 50 partner. So that's all in this, this year. And additionally, I would say, um, I would have started marketing earlier. I was a big find my deals in the MLS kind of guy. And then as that has been running dry, I mean, I, I saw it cause I submit the offers. Um, and, and I have agents who submit the offers. And when that was drying up, I'm like, oh, this isn't good. Like, there's my pipeline of deals. So then I, three months ago, revamped mailers. Like, I started, stop, started, stop, started, stop. And I, I referenced that even on my Bigger Pockets episode. And uh, that was one of my big failures. Well, since that Bigger Pockets episode, and now speaking on your podcast, it's, hey, I have three months into these mailers, and I got some deals coming in. So it, that actually, the last six months have been some turmoil because I lost my my lead generation pipeline, MLS, it's just not working out the way I, I, to my margins. Gotcha. And then obviously you could figure that out and just quickly pivot to, to direct mail. So that, yeah. that's a, that's direct a mail just has this lag though. Right. So you start it and you're expecting the results. The first time somebody hits them, hits their, their mailbox and the odds of somebody be like, you know what, you call me at the perfect time and you're the only person who mailed me this month or this week or this day. Like that, those odds are astronomical. In fact, people are like, oh, uh, which card are you? Because I have four sitting here on my desk. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, like everybody's doing the mailers now. So here I am a little bit late to the game. Right, right. Okay, that's interesting. So you said you have 15 units, 50-50 split. Um, would you say the rent, the, 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 the units you have do better based on the location? Because Baltimore, as any other city, has pockets, right? Um, what are your thoughts on the different pockets, if you are in different pockets, or you, if you just focus on the Class A, Class B areas? No, I'm, in, I'm, I'm all cash flow and I'm in different pockets. Yeah. So 
that's the one thing is again um back to the mentorship is i, I have a mentor who has over 100 units and he self-manages all of them and the man is bored like he two hours a day maybe he's working and he self-manages over 100 units and he owns them outright himself well some of them have leverage but he owns them by himself no partners and i have taken some advice from him and what he said was just do not buy for appreciation go buy all for cash flow as you're especially as you're building and as you're building a portfolio that cash flow can be redeployed that's what the banks want to see the cash flow and that's how you're going to survive the shift the same way he survived the last shift because the top tier tenants think about it, it all starts with jobs people start losing jobs so they can afford less in rent so the a tenants go and afford b class properties and then the b tenants go to the c class properties so next thing you know he's chilling the c class properties and he's getting b tenants so he's getting better tenants and he's still cash flowing and he doesn't care about the value of his property because he didn't buy it for the appreciation. That right there was like a eye-opening experience. Cause I'm like, I don't want to buy rentals until after this market shifts out, it corrects itself. Instead, I'm like, all right, well, even though it's pretty hot right now, and I know a lot of people can relate, they're still good cash flowing deals. So we have our criteria and I have my criteria for the rentals. And that's just a, a simple 25% cash on cash return. Meet my debt service coverage ratio one and a quarter and uh, depending on what's multi or single, then I have another layer. I, I watch my free cash flow per month. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, the banks usually want like 1.2 for the, you know, DCR. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. I'm seeing 1.25 and they're becoming more strict. A lot of, uh, I know there's a big bank here locally that stopped lending and it might be a sign that what's to come is lending to be, Deals are harder to find. Lending might become more difficult. At the same time, somebody's out there getting the market share and making money. Right. Yeah. We we we, we hear about this mark. You know, this market correction coming, and it, it looks like it's coming, but it feels like it's taking forever. So I guess investors like us were just staying bullish and I guess optimistic, and we have to see how that we have to see how the ship um, goes. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, we're buying for cash flow. So if the market does shift down. It, it only actually helps us because if we have no care in the world about our valuation, that's not part of our, um, our performa, then that's just an added benefit. Then we get better tenants and we still get our rent per month and maybe it goes down a little bit because the jobs totally fine though, because if you cushion yourself, even like a 25% cash on cash, hard deals to find, but when you get them, we should be fine. And this is me speaking on somebody else's experience. I personally, obviously I'm, I'm a, only five years into it. I didn't experience the last shift, but I can say that uh, of those who survived, it seems to be a common denominator. They bought for cash flow. Hmm. And uh, typically you're in the lower income areas that when you're doing that, at least in Baltimore. Right. So I'm a dual listener in the gym, you know, on the treadmill. I'm like, wow, I like this Brenton guy. I, I want to do something, you know, something similar to what he's doing, but I don't have any money. I have no money. what do you say to that person? Yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> I didn't either. Uh, and I understood this idea of raising capital. And uh, I started reaching out to friends and saying, hey, who has money? Like, who's killing it? Like, who has the money? Like, I don't. Who has the money? And I have friends who are working at, like, accounting firms and others who are living at home or renting cheap, and they're pocketing it. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, I got 30, 40K, or I got 50K. And, oh, okay. So then you can go out and you can go get a, a hard money loan or some institutional financing and both of which are still going to have you bring capital to the table. Well, then that's when you ask your buddy who has 40 K in his bank account earning nothing and say, Hey man, why don't we work out a deal where you lend me the money? I'll give you X percent interest. And, um, I haven't given up any equity on any of these deals. So it's, I'll give you interest and then, I will take that money, pair it with some other source, hard money or institutional or private, and then buy the property or and then get to the refi. And so what our strategy is, um, is their value add play. And that's super common. It's how you force your equity. It's, the point is you buy it, stabilize the asset through some sort of repositioning management or um, renovations or both in other ways. And then you take that asset and you refinance with the bank. And it's worth more, so the bank gives you more back. You can pay off your investor buddy. You can pay off your other loan, whether it's hard money. And maybe there's some left for you, or maybe you have to leave a couple thousand in. But there's 
there are so many models out there to do it with no money. Like, don't let that stop you. And I would say, got to go find that deal. The money will follow. You hear it all the time. I'm, I have proven it. And if you're sitting there saying, well, I don't know what a good deal is. Like, how do I go find a good deal? Then I would say, go take that time that you'd be finding the deal. Go shadow or work for somebody who knows what deals are in your area. And then you'll learn quickly. Sweet. So definitely I checked out Rec, right? I really, I really like the name. It's so catchy. I really like the <laughs> name. So do you want to tell our uh, dwellers and myself a little bit about Rec and what that's about? Yeah, sure. So uh, that's uh, my network. It started, I launched university real estate clubs, uh, three and three universities in Maryland. And then it has evolved a lot since we had an event. We had Gary Vaynerchuk and David Osborne out. So those of you big Gary V fans or David Osborne fans, we had uh, this event here in Maryland. And then it's sort of like, all right, we're into university clubs. Oh, let's do events. Oh, and then now where we are is really amazing. It's this Facebook group, that's all. And it's called Reckon Stories, R-E-C-N, Stories, S-T-O-R-I-E-S. And it's where every month, I will pick four individuals who are building something, some sort of entrepreneurship venture, and I will showcase them and it's like their TV show. So it's like they're the November 2017 season of Reckon Stories. And each of them have a day of the week where they legitimately share their story with our Reckon audience. So it's getting a sneak peek behind the scenes look at these incredible entrepreneurs in our community and they just go Facebook Live on their day of the week. So every day of the week, there's a Facebook Live for you to catch. And some of the information shared has the power of changing one's trajectory. So I, I recommend it. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is awesome. That is super, super awesome. So we're definitely um, dwelling into the quick round. So these are going to be like quick questions, quick answers. You ready? Cool. I'm ready. First question. What would you say is the differentiating factor or trait that separates Brenton from the next guy or the next girl? The ability to model. And I can say that confidently because it's just coming from being humble and learning from the mistakes is modeling somebody out there who's done it more successfully in that area and find out what they're doing and do what they're doing before you get creative. And then once you nail down what they're doing, then you can get creative or okay. find another person to model. But I'm really good at modeling. Nice. Second question, what was the last book that you read? And what was the one sort of nugget that you learned from that book? Yeah, the last book I read, coincidentally, was The Art of Storytelling. And um, I will say that the number one takeaway I got from that book is putting yourself in that moment. So when you're sharing the story, rather than thinking about what others might be thinking with you're saying it or blah, blah, blah it's, Take yourself back to that moment. What do you see? What are you hearing? What are you smelling? And walk somebody through the story as if you're there all over again and they'll join you. So um, I guess like interviews like this and, and other ways of like now developing these stories, I want to understand, well, how do the best tell stories? And I grabbed the book, The Art of Storytelling. Oh, wow. I like that. I never heard of that one. Thank you so much for sharing that. I would definitely have that in the show notes. Final question. So you've got, Wreck going on. You've got the MBA you're trying to, you know, finish. You've got the real estate activities. You've got the two employees that, you know, they're looking up to you. You've got a ton, a ton of stuff going on. What do you do for fun? <laughs> I, my portfolio lender asked me this. We went out for drinks and uh, some sushi and I was just grilling him with questions. And he's like, tell me about like, who are you? Like, what do you do for fun? And I was like, what's, what's this fun? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I am a proud uncle of two, my niece Aww. and nephew. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if I can. I'm going to grab a picture real quick. Hold on. Do it. Do oh, it. It's actually on my phone, on my background. Yeah. So do it. <laughs> they, Oh yeah. Hmm. I can relate. I have a four month old baby. I can relate that. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's so my, uh, my unclehood is, uh, proud, uh, proud uh fun of mine and that's at least once a week i'll get to hang out with them and see them and then uh sports i play and watch just about every sport so now it's now it's a lot more tennis and golf that i'm playing getting old but i still watch every sport pretty much that is awesome that is you? so awesome what do you oh, do for fun man 
I was about to say, what is that fun thing? What is that thing you mm-hmm. call fun, right? You know, for me right now, fun is just like coming home and just like playing with my baby, you know? Um, actually, you're the first guest that actually asked me the question back. So uh, Dwell is not going to get to know me a little bit more. Yeah, I have yeah. my baby so, so much. And for me, fun is when I meet people, I want to make sure that I, I live an impact in their lives, right? I connect with them. So I have fun by making sure I make that lasting impact, but it has to be through humor. So when I meet you, I make sure we laugh, we joke at every second. So that's how I have fun. That's how I have fun. My baby that's and sweet. connecting with people. And connecting with them through humor. That's like through a, humor. your own like spin on thing. I mean, you have very clear on who you are and what you want to get out of people. That's, that's it impactful now i got to think about like okay well connecting with people what am i bringing to the table that's unique you're bringing humor that's yep that's yep. great so that's, i like it we've had we've had a lot of good laughs tonight. yeah <laughs> thank you so you yeah you, you see yeah that's that's kind of what i i think life should be about right it's so short i call it zero to 80 you know we don't live that long um i mean we, we live longer compared to the previous generation but we don't live that long so when you meet people or when you mm-hmm. touch people you should just bring the bring the kid out of them right everybody laughed as a kid right so what happened right somebody told them something they couldn't become someone or whatever and they changed right they become grumpy so that's kind of what i i like to do typically uh, i love that yeah thanks yeah. for sharing yeah hey, we should get you should be interviewed on your podcast I'm do sure. it <laughs> more more nuggets i'm sure in there <laughs> do it. i mean we're, we're you know we're in the same city i think we should definitely connect um you know, I definitely want to introduce to Ryan as well. Um, my, my partner, he's awesome. So we, we definitely collect. But but thank you so, so much, Brenton. We're going to um, let it dwell, listeners go. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is such a pleasure. I appreciate you. And uh, looking forward to connecting. The first, this is the beginning of much more, for sure.